Thank you very much. Now, how do I get this to uh, do what it's supposed to do? My name is Mark McLeod from the University of Edinburgh. I'm computerly not very literate, as you've just seen. Uh, now, who's driving this? I'm, I'm getting your presentation. I'm sorry. Okay. And so is there a slight advance? It was, yeah, but something happened. Okay. Okay, and then when I want the next slide, Angela, what do I do? Um, I can do it for you or I can give you the... Can you give me the thing? Because then otherwise we're going to do a lot of animated animating, which <laughs> will create chaos. Uh, in the background here are all the people. Uh, there's a British artist called Tracy Emin who did a famous piece of work, a bed with lots of rubbish around about it, called All the People I've Ever Slept With. And uh, <laughs> this is all the people I've ever, I've ever worked with, uh, uh, apart from this one here who I've worked with and I'm married to. Uh, uh, and the errors which follow are mine and not theirs. I want to give you a sort of whistle-stop tour through why I think things are, are wrong. Um, so we're restoring faith in the research enterprise. I don't want to advocate one particular religion or any over another, but faith in Hebrews is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And so what we're talking about is the ability to take something presented as science at face value without individually having to go into the nuts and bolts of absolutely everything, because with 3,000 publications added to PubMed every day, if we had to do that, we'd spend a long time reading and not very much time doing. Um, and uh, I'm interested in the idea of reproducibility as a, as a, a fourth R, because here are the identifiable costs of research and their reduction, replacement, refinement, and the resource required. And all of these things you know about up front before you're doing your experiment, while you're planning your programme of work. But the reproducibility must be something which comes afterwards, must be something that can only be done after the fact. But are there things that you can do at the start of your experiment which increase the prospects that your findings will actually be, be reproducible, will increase the value of the information which your uh, which your research has produced. And I think in the ethical considerations about experiments using animals, traditionally we have focused rather uh, overly much on the identifiable costs of the research and not given an adequate ethical consideration to the potential benefits and trying to ascertain what those potential benefits might be up front. So what's the value of information? Well, there's a few things. Firstly, is the research question that we're asking actually important to anyone, really? Does it improve human health in my sphere? Does it advance knowledge? Do our findings describe what happens in our highly refined model systems? That's pretty fundamental. Do those findings have a more general validity in our target biological systems? And do we make our findings available to others so that they might uh, take advantage of them in their work and apply them in sufficient detail for that to be a meaningful, a meaningful process. So here's some examples of where things have failed. This work was done just down the road, uh, and an ex it's an experiment in focal ischemia, blocking the blood vessel in an artery supplying the brain of an animal, looking at what happens to the volume here of the stroke that occurs in that animal 72 hours later. And there are many thousands of these experiments in the literature. This one's using low-dose glutamate and homeopathic arnica montana, and you can see that half-dose improve things a little bit and full-dose improve things a lot more. But those of you who remember your high school chemistry will understand that 10 to the minus 120 molar is substantially below Avogadro's constant. So either homeopathy is alive and well and exists in Bethesda, if nowhere else, <laughs> or there's something wrong with this experimental ap approach, which is rendering it falsely positive, and I favour the latter explanation. The, the other thing in passing, of course, is the homeopaths have their columns the wrong way round, because 10 to the minus 120 molar should be more powerful than 10 to the minus 60 molar, given what they believe about the effects of dilution. Here's something closer to home, which is another falsely positive experiment. This is using a technique called functional MRI scanning. This is based on the precept that if I use a bit of my brain, uh, then it requires more energy. And in requiring more energy, the blood flow increases. And I can detect that change in blood flow in a fancy scanner, which is very expensive. And you have to set up and trim and adjust once a week to make sure that it's running properly. <laughs> 
And this group in Boston had a competition to see who could find the most outrageous piece of organic matter to put in the scanner on a Monday morning to trim it and set it up. And this guy, Craig Bennett, uh, happened to live on the far side of the fish market. So one Monday morning, he stopped off and bought a fish and said, no one's had a fish in the scanner before. That will be fun. Uh, and so they put the fish in the scanner. The fish was 18 inches long. It weighed about four pounds, and it wasn't alive at the time of scanning. And then something, one of their subjects cancelled that day. So they said, well, why don't we have a bit of a laugh and put the salmon through the entire study protocol? And that's what they did. The task administered to the salmon involved completing an open-ended mentalising task. The salmon were shown a series of photographs <laughs> depicting humans with specified emotional valence. The humans were happy or sad or perplexed or puzzled as to quite where the lecturer was going. And the salmon was asked to determine which emotion the individual in the photo must have been experiencing at the time. And I don't know if you can see here, but several active voxels in the salmon equivalent of the orbitofrontal cortex, the bit of the brain that always lights up in these studies, lit up in the dead salmon. To which they uh, conclude that either they've stumbled onto a rather amazing discovery in terms of post-mortem ichthyological cognition, <laughs> that's to say that dead salmon can think, or there's something wrong with the statistical methods used in this approach, for which they were, I think, rightly awarded the Ig Nobel Prize for Neuroscience a couple of years ago. So what happens when pharma tries to replicate the findings that come out from academic groups? And this is something we're going to hear more about later. This is work from Bayer in Berlin, where uh, apparently pharma don't do very much primary research anymore. They just scan the literature and say, oh, we think that's druggable. Let's see if we can do that in-house. And then if it's in-house, we'll develop a drug which interferes with that process. And so they looked at that in-house target identification and validation projects over four years in these disease areas and in 67 projects. And they found that fully two-thirds of them were not reproducible when they took them in-house. So two-thirds of what's in the published literature is false, apparently. Uh, I think that's pretty much on top of Johnny Anidis, who we're going to hear from uh, tomorrow, of his estimate of, uh, of, of what the problem might be. And so as a result of that, uh, in 2009, the Lancet carried an article by Ian Chalmers, who had set up the Cochrane Collaboration, a group who've done a great deal to improve the quality of clinical studies involving humans testing drugs, and Paul Glasier, which estimated at the time that about 85% of research effort was wasted for a, a variety of reasons. And we uh, refreshed that early this year with a series of five articles in The Lancet which went through different pieces of the research endeavour and tried to identify where there was waste. Uh, and if you've not read it, I would recommend it to you. Perhaps not this uh, introductory diatribe unless you want a bit of light entertainment. But these are really good descriptors of what's happening. And they set out across five different domains area in which research effort is wasted. The questions, are they relevant to the users of the research? Is the research conducted with appropriate design and analysis? Is there efficient, not overly burdensome, but is there efficient research regulation and delivery? Are the reports full and accessible, and are they unbiased and usable? And I want to take three examples from this today very briefly to show you where I think some problems arise. So in animal studies, there's the issue of randomization and blinding. So randomization is where the experimental animal has an equal chance of ending up in any of the experimental groups prior to the start of the experiment, not determined by where they happen to sit in the cage. So if I was to do an experiment with you lot and take the front two rows for one group and the back for another group, then I might find that there were differences between uh, you in terms of your inquisitiveness, uh, your, your self-confidence, perhaps your average age, and perhaps your average intelligence, which were determined by things other than the experimental treatments I were going to give you, and that would be wrong. And blinding is where, in the conduct or the assessment of the outcome from the experiment, my prejudices about what might happen influence uh, my findings. This is work from 1963, 1963, 50 years ago. This guy, Ronnie Rosenthal, who described the file drawer uh, problem, uh, taught a graduate course in psychology. And as part of this, the students at the end of the course had to do an experiment. And the experiment lasted for a week. And what they had to do, they were given two groups of, of, of uh, rats. Some were maize bright, bred over many, many generations at Berkeley, then a leader in cognition research to perform well in mazes such as this. And others that were their slightly thicker inbred country cousins who performed poorly in such tasks. And essentially, you put the rat at the stem of the maze, it gets to this junction and has to decide either to go to the dark side or to the bright, and the dark side is always reinforced with food, and which is dark and which is light change at random. 
So what did they find? Well, the maize bright animals, as you would expect, started off better than the maize dull animals, and they learned faster and they learned more than their maize dull colleagues. And when you spoke to the students who did this experiment, they said that these maize bright animals were uh, fluffy and inquisitive and friendly, and they quite liked them, and could they take them home as a pet? And these animals uh, were just a bit dull and didn't do very much, uh, and actually bit a few of the students. <laughs> um, and of course, the payoff is that there was no difference between these groups of animals. They were selected at random from the same cages in the same animal house on the first day of the experiment, and the only difference was in the minds of the students okay. doing the experiment. And you get these huge biological effects, which would get me into nature just now if I could show that I could breed rats like that. Um, so let's look across some disease models. So these are experiments where you use animals to see whether your candidate drug improves outcome in your model of, in this case, stroke and Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis and in Parkinson's disease. And what we've done here is taken together data from a large number of animal experiments to get a summary estimate of overall how good is the drug and what are the 95% confidence limits. This bar is that estimate with the 95% confidence limits. And here we've divided them into those studies that are blinded and no studies that are not blinded. And sometimes the order flips, but the green arrows always show the high quality studies at less risk of bias, and always they give lower estimates of how good these drugs are. And most drugs that are taken to clinical trial are taken on the basis of low quality evidence, unfortunately. So how big is this as a problem? Because if 99% of the studies are, are blinded and 1% and aren't, then, then that probably doesn't matter very much. This is the stroke literature in animals. About a third of studies are randomised, about a third are blinded. Only 3% say at the beginning of the experiment how they worked out how big the experiment should be to try and pick up what they were looking for. And when we did this, we were told that that was the reason that we didn't have a good treatment for stroke, because our scientists were lousy. And if our scientists were any good, like all the other scientists, then we would have developed an effective treatment. So we tried to answer that question by looking at Alzheimer's modelling and Parkinson's modelling and MS modelling and pain modelling, and you can see that actually these are at much higher risk of bias than the stroke literature where we started. And then you can imagine what happened next. We were told that this was because neuroscientists in general were pretty lousy, uh, and that if we were anything like the cancer doctors, we'd be much, much better, and we'd have effective treatments like we've got for some cancers for HIV. So. Every publication in PubMed has got a unique identifier, which is a number between 1 and 23 million. So if you give me a random number between 1 and 23 million, I will give you a random publication, selected completely at random from PubMed, to the extent that PubMed is generalizable to the rest of the life sciences literature. Um, and this is what we did here. Uh, so we uh, selected 2,000 publications at random from PubMed, and we selected from those about 10-12% uh, uh, which described in vivo, ex vivo or in vitro research and we looked at them for the risk of bias and here you can see it in five different time periods the reporting in green of blinding reaching a heady 5% uh, conflict of interest statement not doing very much and then really really coming off the block sharply since 2006 probably because of a change in journal uh, editorial policies and randomization starting to, to creep up a little bit and getting to about 30%, about the same as the stroke literature overall uh, by the end of that period. Now that includes in vivo experiments using animals but also in vitro experiments in the lab and if you look just at the in vivo experiments now in a random sample from PubMed the rate of reporting of randomization is about 37%. So then we were told well, that's just selecting random junk from PubMed, and we know that most stuff that's published is junk. Why don't you look at high-quality institutions and see what their research output is? So that's what we did. Uh, we have got this crazy thing uh, called the research assessment exercise in the UK, where the government tries to find out how good researchers are by asking other researchers. And you can imagine what the result is. Uh, researchers have made an outstanding contribution to the internationally excellent position of the UK in biomedical research. Um, and that kind of conflicted a bit with what we thought might be going on. So <laughs> what we did was we looked at those five institutions in the UK that were assessed in 2008 as being the best for life sciences research. And we looked at their research output in 2009 and 2010 for in vivo research, so studies involving animal experiments. Uh, and we identified over 1,000 publications from those five institutions uh, published in 2009 and 2010, and this is what you get. 
like, rather like an audit of whether your neurologist is any good at diagnosing epilepsy. I've, I've uh, colour-coded the institutions to protect the innocent uh, and my career. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but here you can see a prevalence of randomisation of about 15%, of blinding 18%, inclusion exclusion criteria less than 10%, power calculation about 2%. And what for me is really interesting about this is that you can actually detect significant differences between institutions in their use of risk of bias measures that I think would give you a much more powerful indication of the quality of the research output than a group of men and women sitting around a table. And remember what I said about the PubMed average for in vivo research? So the PubMed average is statistically significantly higher, almost twice as high, in reporting randomization than is the research output from the UK's four leading biomedical institutions. And some of you may be sitting there thinking that couldn't possibly be the case in this great land of the free, uh, but I, I, I think you need to look before you can say that. Interestingly, we're repeating this exercise now, and all of the manuscripts have been submitted for the Research Excellence Framework 2014, and we made a Freedom of Information request to have those so that when they came out in December and said something like this, we could say, well, maybe you need to temper your enthusiasm. Unfortunately, and rather disappointingly, they said that they did not think this would be in the public interest. Uh, it's certainly not in their interests, because I am almost certain it will, it will devalue what they have to say. But I do think it is probably in the public interest, uh, probably. Uh, and then we were told that if you looked in journals of high impact, then of course things would be good, because nature and science had really good editorial policies that ironed out this. So this is looking across 2,900 publications in the in vivo stroke literature, by deciles of journal impact factor in which that work was published from the bottom 10% to the top 10%. And conflict of interest statements rise across the spectrum. Uh, sample size calculations are hardly ever reported by anyone. Uh, blinding is pretty static across the spectrum. Uh, but importantly, randomization is not. There is an inverse relationship between the reporting of randomization and the impact factor of the journal of the work of, of, of the journal which is carrying your work. So, for those of you that do this kind of work, who have institutions saying, "Please, please, please, can uh, you tell me where you've published your great work?" You say, "Great news, guys! All my work is published in journals of very low impact, which means it's much more likely to be of high quality than the stuff that my colleague down the corridor that you recruited from God knows where on a big dowry and a lab funded for five years who got into." Nature wants the work that he does. So let's look now at whether studies are published in full. This is in vivo models and multiple sclerosis testing drugs, uh, starting off with, uh, with almost uh, 10,000 publications, of which uh, uh, testing over, over almost 2,000 interventions. And we were interested in about 203 of these because they met certain criteria, which I needn't go into. But of those 203, we had to junk 72. So that's fully a third of them, because they simply did not present the data in a way that we could understand or that we could use. So 72 didn't actually present any valid outcomes, although they claimed in their abstract to have found something. 58% didn't report the variance of the data, and, and so it goes on and so it goes on. In, a, in a, an unselected group of studies describing drug efficacy in multiple sclerosis. This is the Morris Water Maze, a test using a, a pool to test animal memory. And you put the animal in, and it's learned where a platform is that will get it out of the cold water. And the quicker it gets to the platform, the smarter it is. And of course, there's all sorts of things that will determine how well an animal performs that you would want to know if you were going to try and reproduce this. You would want to know how big the pool was, whether it was 80 centimetres down here or 2 metres up here. And 20% of the studies don't tell you how big the pool is. You would want to know how cold the water is, because it's the coldness of the water that drives the animal out of it. And it ranges from 16% to 28%, but over 40% don't tell you the temperature of the water. And you'd like to know how much the animal had been trained, the number of days training, the number of training trials per day, but the modal uh, frequency is that they don't tell you either the number of acquisition trials per day or the number of days training. So not great. There's an issue about reporting dropouts, which is also important. This is one of our experiments, testing a drug called minocycline in an animal model of stroke, and you've got 13 animals in each group here. This is a good outcome, this is a poor outcome, and you can see that there's a bit of a shift with control animals seeing to have more blue and red up towards this end, and there's a change in the median outcome measure, not significant in this case. 
We didn't present this, we presented this, which is unusual because we included the five animals in the minocycline group that had actually died, probably an important endpoint in itself, but when you do that, any uh, beneficial effect simply disappears. And the vast majority of animal studies that I read don't tell you the number of animals that were excluded from the analysis, or if they do, they don't tell you why they were excluded, and I think that's critical. Uh, and finally, the, the issue of publication bias. So something gets into your laboratory notebook, and then uh, it might get into a draft manuscript. And then, depending uh, on how assiduous you are in trying to publish it, and how friendly the journals are in being willish to, willing to publish it, it will either stay in your file drawer, or it might get into a journal of repute where other people might read your research. Now, if there's a difference, if this process of whether it ends up in the file drawer or down here is affected by factors of the study or the findings of the study, then looking just in the published literature will give you a biased view of what's actually happening. So here's disease models in animals, taking all of that Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, all of that stuff together, where what you're looking for is an improvement, because that's what gets you your paper. And on average, it does improve things by about 40%, but when you correct for publication bias, that improvement falls by about a quarter. The, uh, there's other disease models that are used in a similar way, and that's environmental toxicology models. And this is studies looking at whether giving a pregnant dam a chemical which might be harmful affects the birth weight of the pups which are born to her. And this is a regulatory requirement for industries wishing to get their new chemicals uh, uh, regulated and approved. And you can see that there is some evidence of harm. If you take this, this is uh, 403 experiments taken all together. There is some evidence of harm. But when you, ad uh, when you adjust for publication bias, that harm appears to be substantially higher. So the direction of publication bias is determined or appears to, to be consistent with the interests of the people who are interested in funding the research. Now, that toxicology data is very, very preliminary, so uh, you now have to eat it if you've thought it, uh, and it needs to be confirmed. But I think it's a very interesting observation that we need to bottom out. Uh, and this is work with John Ioannidis' uh, group looking at, at individual uh, publications where, for instance, you might measure 20 different outcomes in an animal, but only five or six of them get into the publication. And you can look statistically to see whether that might be happening. And of over 4,000 experimental outcomes, we observed that 1,700 met the criteria for statistical significance. But through some fancy statistics, which I needn't go into, looking at the distribution of the exact p-values and, and the effect sizes in these, one would expect, if they were drawn from all the experiments that had been done, that only 900 would have been statistically significant, which means about half of the results have been suppressed at that process of reporting what you did. So incomplete reporting of the experiments that were done from 1,700 down to 900. Uh, so how big a hole, taking all of this together, does this make in published research? Well, if you account for risk of bias, it makes a hole of about 20%. If you account for publication bias, it makes another hole of about 20%. And if you account for the problems with sample size where studies are done but underpowered, then it makes another hole of about 20%, which gets me to a figure that about 60% of published in vivo research just now is wasted of the research effort, of the students' time, of the investigators' time, of the animals used for these three simple things that would be pretty easy to fix. So how do we improve quality? Well, we should remember what we knew. This is Fisher, the design of experiments the man who went on to defend the tobacco industry, but in his early years he was quite a good statistician. Uh, and then there's the ARRIVE guidelines, and Natalie's in the audience, I think, who's, who's been uh, promulgating these around the world, up, taken up now by about 380, 390 journals. More honoured in the breach than the in the observance, though, because the quality does remain poor, and David Baker has shown that. Uh, and more recently, uh, uh, Shai Silberberg and Story Landis's call in Nature a couple of years ago, which I think helpfully boils it down to some of the uh, low-hanging fruit, the things that we should do immediately now because there's a very clear and present risk of bias and some of the things that we do need to also to think about in the longer term. So that's all I wanted to say. A lot of this work has come from assimilating together information from large numbers of animal studies. Our database now contains information on about 100,000 individual experiments. Uh, and it's only through doing that that you're able to draw the conclusions that I've drawn. So I think there's a message in there about research collaboration. And if people are interested in doing a similar thing in their own, in their own area, you'd be very welcome to get in touch. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Malcolm. Our next speaker is Dr. Henry Bourne uh, from the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, and again, uh, under the theme of uh, scientists and practitioners of the art, uh, a call to action from the inside. Thank you. Well, on the way here, on the, in the taxi, I was asked by a person who did not know me, which is about 99% of the audience here, what were my qualifications for uh, 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 this meeting? And I was able to state that I have the two prime qualifications. One is that I have committed unreproducibility. The second is that I don't know exactly when or where or what it was. Okay. Now, that is, I think, true of most scientists. Uh, and what I'm going to do is to tell you, instead of my qualification, what it is that actually got me invited here. Uh, it is that I have been talking about all the troubles that beset biochemical research that are not unreproducibility, that have to do with uh, where the money is going, how much money there is, and how science is organized, especially in the U.S. And the question I was asked over the telephone when Lita invited me was, uh, did I think that this might contribute to unreproducibility of results? And the answer was yes, but the real answer was that I like uh, to be a Jeremiah, and I thought this was an opportunity for extending my Jeremiad uh, to you. Um, the, uh, we'll see what the truth is here. Uh, and now the next slide I press forward. Is there something that does a forward here? No, that went backwards. Oh, wait a minute. So if you point at that, and it's that one to go forward. This one? No, no, oh. that's your laser, the one on the... This no, one? That one, and okay. point it at oh, that. Okay. okay, so the topics I'm going to talk about, I'm going to do the Jeremiah ad first. Uh, I'm going to talk about U.S. biomedical research and the problems that we have here. All of you know about these, uh, but very few of you, I would be willing to bet, based on my own colleagues, uh, have paid a lot of attention to them because they bother you and you don't want to trouble yourselves with them. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the question of whether, whether and how they might re relate to unreproducible results. And finally, uh, we'll talk about what can and should we do. So everybody, I'm one of the older folks here in this room, but anybody who's reached the age of 74 knows that biomedical scientists' lives have changed profoundly over the last 50 years. Uh, that is to say, we, there are lots of new, what we call new symptoms that were beginning uh, maybe 30 years ago and have gotten worse. One is that PIs compete much more fiercely than they did when I was young. Trainees are vastly more anxious about their futures. Their training is slow. It takes them a long time to become scientists uh, and the training is inefficient. The, the uh, principal investigators are worried about their jobs, about publications, about salaries and grants, and how many grants they have to write. Uh, the NIH, uh, our uh, flagship funder, is uh, uh, plagued with stagnant budgets, arbitrary peer review, and overwhelmed peer review, and muddled priorities. The research professoriate is aging rapidly. When I became a scientist, there were, at my university, no gray hair in the elevator. Okay? Think about that. I wonder, where did they keep their old people? Now, I have become that gray hair, uh, and that's what's happened to all of us, and there's no question about this. There are wonderful uh, statistics to show that this is the case. The 60-year-olds are dominant, and sometimes the 70-year-olds. Uh, there are too few sufficiently prestigious journals. Everybody goes for those journals, and we have given our trust to them. 
uh, to decide what is actually worthwhile. Uh, and finally, s public support for science is weaker across the board. Now, these are really troubling. Uh, what do we, what are the responses? <laughs> the responses to those symptoms are terribly disappointing. There is the what may worry response, uh, which is the one I frequently see. Oh, it's much too complicated for me to worry about. Uh, there is the I'm doing fine, or maybe I'm not doing fine, but full steam ahead. That is the captain of the Titanic. Can we know what happened to him? Uh, there is the fat cat response. Uh, let them eat cake. There are lots of especially senior scientists who are doing relatively well. Their fourth grant may not have been renewed, but they've still got three, and they're doing wonderfully. And they say, basically, let them eat cake. And again, the most common response, the one I see everywhere, is uh, the Louis XVI response of give me more money like you used to do. Uh, that, we know what happened to Louis XVI uh, as well. Uh, those responses are, to put it uh, mildly, uh, unuseful. Uh, now, we know what the primary cause of this is in the US, and that is, that NIH budgets grew 10% per year for 45 years. Now, 10% per year is way ahead of inflation, and that meant that it was possible to keep all the things that didn't work going on and still do lots of new things that were really good and to have a wonderful time, okay? Now, that stopped in 2003, but before it stopped, it produced a genuine addiction to growth with rampant expansionism of all our institutions and most of our labs. Uh, we, the PIs, the labs, the research institutions, the NIH, and even Congress adapted to this abundance, and those adaptations produce consequences. And there are lots of people who have written about this. Uh, these are uh, their articles appear, there are books about this, uh, but uh, scientists pay relatively little attention. Uh, uh, we know also that what happened during this addiction is that mechanisms uh, developed uh, that uh, uh, allowed it to really set in. And they depended on early Faustian bargains. One of them was that indirect costs paid on grants have incentives that produce more buildings and more soft money salaries uh, that have gotten to the point that uh, a vast amount of the salary of our research professoriate is paid directly by the NIH and not by the institution. That has consequences, real consequences, for the way people behave. There's just no question about it. Uh, Another Faustian bargain is that we uh, made uh, trainees into our lab workforce uh, and hired very few people whose job it was actually to do work. We were training them, which meant, of course, that they had to do work, and that's what our goal was uh, with them. Uh, this, both of these were superb uh, responses to the early expansion and the need for more scientists and the need for more research, uh, they became gradually more dangerous with time. And expansion fostered more bargains, uh, so universities increasingly judge their faculty in terms of indirect cost recovery on their grants, because that's what institutions uh, live on. Uh, universities increasingly prefer older researchers because they're reliable grant recipients over young ones, and state at several places I have visited um, that uh, they will no longer hire young people without grants. They want to hire only people who already have grants because those are the reliable ones. Uh, and we now trust a few journals and an arbitrary overburdened NIH peer review system to determine whether scientists are worth supporting without making those judgments ourselves in our institutions. That is a real potential problem. So now, uh, 
that means that there are very strong positive feedbacks to expansion and weak negative feedbacks. And that means that when the NIH stops increasing this 10%, which it did in 2003, and has remained flat, its budget is flatlined after that, uh, there's nothing to prevent the increasing expansion. We don't respond to that. We act as if the money is going to continue and is, in fact, in continuing. And that causes uh, much more competition. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's see if I can go back. Um, it causes uh, all of these effects that we talked about before, including the graying of the research prof professoriate and an extra hard time for young faculty. And uh, I want to make it really clear that these effects are not caused by the flatlining of the NIH budgets. They're only shown more clearly by them. That is to say, in the late 1990s, when the budgets were still increasing, every one of these effects was already present. So this is not some, oh dear, they'll start giving us money again and everything will f be fixed. Uh, if, if they give us money again, we'll do the same damn thing uh, that we did before. So what has this to do with unreproducible uh, experimental results? The short answer is we can't be sure. And the reason is that the question is drawn so broadly that there's no way that I can think of of actually exploring it and really testing the possibility that this general atmosphere of anxiety and worry uh, and uh, lack of thought about what we're doing is producing more unreproducibility. Now that doesn't keep me, as uh, all of you all have had this feeling also, you know what is going on, as Malcolm said, we know what's going on, and I feel absolutely certain that in fact uh, what I've talked to you about does have to do with unreproducible res results um, in research. There's just no question about it. But the long answer is that that may be true, but uh, we, and we can easily make uh, pathways of causation. Worse conditions may make some experimental results less reliable and reproducible. You bet they could. We can think of a thousand ways that that could happen, and I am certain that that happens. But there is no convincing evidence that this is the case, and I defy you to devise an experiment that would show this in any way that you could trust. But the big problem with that, and this is what has worried me about giving this talk, is that if we, supposing we knew this and had proved it, and we absolutely were certain that it was the case, what would we do about it? Oh, hmm. Because we're not doing anything about the larger problem of our uh, uh, research system in the U.S. anyhow, in spite of my Jeremiah, which gets a little bit of attention here and there, uh, people are largely sitting on their behinds and uh, sort of enjoying themselves and saying it's all going to get better. Um, and so you can't do anything uh, about unreproducibility by tackling this. I think we should be tackling these problems that I've talked about hammer and tongs, but not because of unreproducibility. That is a separate problem which has to be approached on its own terms. And so uh, I agree with Malcolm that other kinds of evidence will be more useful. And I have another slide that doesn't seem to want to show itself. Uh, could we have the last slide? Hmm, I guess we can't. Oh, there it is, okay. So basically, it is essentially to identify specifically the questions, experiments, uh, measurements, and conditions that tend to produce unreproducibility the most often. In other words, we act like scientists and we try to define precisely what the problem is, and then we use that information to target and guide reform, and uh, that behaving like scientists uh, 
I've uh, put Louis Pasteur up here. Uh, the milk is sour. What do we do? We figure out what uh, is causing it, um, and then we pasteurize it. We actually try to do something. Those are really essential steps. We don't have the equivalent of the germ theory of disease, which he had to invent to do this, but we have to we do have uh, some facts, as you've already heard. We'll hear more. We need more facts, and we need to focus on what the causes most likely are and go after those hammer and tongs. So I feel a little bad about having <coughs> put you through this Jeremiah to tell you that you should do something about it. I have all sorts of prescriptions of what you should do about that larger problem, but I have mercifully left you alone and will not do tell you about these. I've written lots of papers about them. You can easily find them. They tell you exactly what to do, and every, nobody is doing any of it. Uh, but I think it can be done. So I'll stop there, and uh, I guess we'll go on to our questions pretty soon. Thank you. Okay, on to the uh, Q&A portion, uh, and they don't have to be questions or answers. They can be opinions, perspectives. We may have a few Cassandras in the audience as well as Jeremiah's, and they're just as welcome. Uh, when you go to the microphones uh, in the room, please uh, identify yourself uh, and your uh, representative institution, if you have one, uh, and uh, we're now open uh, for commentary. Since I'm by the microphone, hi, Margaret Landy from GSK, and this one's for Malcolm. You talked about incomplete reporting of data. How is that different from data integrity? Do you see that as a data integrity issue or a standard practice that could be interpreted as data integrity? So, so I think incomplete reporting of data happens when you're looking at uh, animal behavior <coughs> when you're modeling multiple sclerosis, say, and you measure a battery of neurobehavioral outcomes, and you report the ones that meet the magic 0 0.05, and you just don't report the ones that don't meet the 0 0.05 because you think the editor's going to get on your case about it. If, if you think about your average, uh, well, I'll, I'll use average. If you think about your average PNAS paper, for instance, just because we're here. And if you look at one that's testing, a, that's testing a, a, a mechanistic hypothesis, so it's saying we think X causes Y, and here's the human epidemiological and the GWAS study, so the genetic study in humans, and then the in vitro, and then, and if you look at all of those, and say you've got six of them, and they all call it as being less than 0 0.05, if you look at the statistical power of each of those, they're powered at around 80% if you're lucky, 50% probably, sometimes a lot less than that. The chances, even if the mechanistic hypothesis is, is correct, that six independent tests of that hypothesis powered at 50% will all say it's statistically significant is about one in 50. So there must be a whole load of suppression of negative stuff, and that, or, or neutral stuff rather, mm -hmm. and that makes it really difficult if you're trying to get an overview of what something if all you're doing is picking from the pool of statistically significant results, then it's going it's to substantially overstate how things are. Now, uh, this has consequences. There was a, a drug called NXY059 that was test marketed by AstraZeneca under the name Cerevive because they thought it would make your cerebrum survive if you'd had a stroke. Clinical trial of 5,000 patients. If you go to the animal literature on which that clinical trial was based, none of the studies involving only four or 500 animals in total, not enough in my view, None of them were randomized and had allocation concealment and blinded the assessment of outcome. And the two used by Astra to <coughs> convince people to put patients into the trial met none of those criteria. So you can put people at harm, as well as wasting animals and resource and all of that, by selective reporting. It's not simply a way of getting past the editor. Could I ask a question? Uh, Jeremiah, you could I ask a question of Malcolm? Certainly. If, if, if that is the case, uh, and it seems like to me it probably is, why 
aren't people aware of it? Uh, why are we not teaching everybody to do that? I can tell you in my own case, uh, I have done only a few animal studies in my life. All my uh, experiments have been biochemical studies in, in vitro and a little bit of tissue culture, but mostly biochemistry. Uh, we thought that point of, we were taught that 0.05 was what you were supposed to do, and that in most cases, if you even had to do a statistical test, you were uh, not doing anything worthwhile. Um, that, that, that is clearly not the case, but we need to get the education out there, and it needs to be hitting young people as well as the old duffers. Uh, how are you going to do that? Uh, so, in, in the Lancet series, we, we try and grapple with some of the issues that you said about how on earth are you going to change things, and I agree that we need evidence for what works. Uh, but the way that I see current behaviour is that scientists operate in a fairly <coughs> complex ecosystem with some fairly bizarre uh, reward systems and punishment systems. And they, as anyone does, operate within their ecosystem f to succeed. So I would try and change the <coughs> ecosystem by introducing a contrasting set of forces which uh, channel them into more appropriate behavior. So for instance, one of the things that I'm very keen on for this question of selective outcome reporting bias is a requirement that people make available in some uh, depository a protocol of what they're going to do and what they're going to measure and it doesn't have to be publicly available but it should be available to the peer reviewer of their journal of the manuscript when they submit it for publication so someone can go back and say but you've got five outcomes that you measured that you've not told us about where are those uh, so th so there are little things that I mean that's not a very little thing but you know we're in nature to say we need to see a protocol which is date stamped from before this experiment started before we'll publish it then very quickly that particular behaviour <coughs> would change. And the second thing that you said that's really critical is, is education and training for the young investigator. Um, and it's something that we do appallingly badly. I think we do it worse now than we've done it before, and that's partly because of the, if you like, the commercialisation of the educational and training process where, where numbers are more important than quality. Um, but I think there are things that can be done and some things that we can take advantage of. You were saying that the, the, the social media and other techniques and technologies that are available to us now that weren't available 20 or 30 years ago, you know, web-based certified uh, uh, training schemes that you can make a mandatory part of your curriculum that you can deliver to either 300 undergraduates or 300,000 undergraduates without there being any additional resource. These are the sorts of things that we should be doing. Um, I'm Pascal Claire from uh, the Humane Society of the United States. My first comment is regarding the incomplete data. I think that, in my opinion, I spent 12 years as a young scientist in the lab um, when I had I made the mistake to open my mouth because I did not agree with the way that statistics were done or the way that uh, groups of animals were used in design or the overall experiment was designed. You know, I was told to just keep it quiet, go to my corner in the lab, do the experiments, because the papers will not get published. And basically, the way experiments are designed now, and at least academic, is we have a goal. It's not even an hypothesis anymore. It's like a goal to publish a data. And we'll do anything to publish this exact data, because that's what we want to have in the literature. And in regard to the incomplete data, I think what happens is because there's no value is neg in negative data in the literature. And I think that's what peop that's one of the reasons why scientists don't publish any data that don't show any significant effects, because they know that the peer review journals will could put the kibosh on the whole paper as, as a whole. And I think putting more emphasis on those negative data or neutral data are very important because it really teaches something. There's something that is missing or something that is not completely working. And I think there's a lot of information that we could get from, from that. So te teaching the young scientists is important, but I think the PIs and older scientists <laughs> needs to be taught. Well, well one of the things that, that you've probably experienced as well, because I, I do my own little Jeremiah act about in vivo research, uh, 
And one of the things that, that, that's uh, very telling is when you write something and it goes out in, in you know, one of the journals, the emails that you get from young investigators who describe just what you've described, saying, I'm enthusiastic <coughs> to do it properly, I think that in my lab it's not being done properly, but whenever I raise it as an issue, I'm told that that's not the way that we do things. Uh, and so I think things like this are important in trying to create a community where people understand that they're not isolated, the only ones who think this is important. But like, I mean, I'm a gradualist. I think there are, there are five or six different stakeholders in this field, and we need to shift the behavior of every stakeholder by five or 10 percent to try and create some momentum rather than there being a single answer that, that will solve it. Paul. Um, hi, my name is Paul Locke. I'm from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'd like to thank you both for your presentations. They were really great and very informative. And I think you pointed out a lot of places where obviously improvement needs to be made. And maybe uh, you've, you've charted the path. We can, we can walk, walk along that road and think of ways to do better work. But my, I guess my question is, um, in your research, have you discovered any successes? Are there, are there any is there any um, sort of model out there that we can use that said, oh, this has really worked, and maybe there's some things that that tells us about how we can apply examples going forward? Uh, so, so I'll give you one. So there's, there's, a, there's a thing about numbers of animals in a cohort of evidence. And, and so we've done what you call a cumulative systematic review, where as each new evident, piece of evidence becomes available, you add it. And, and you see, and once it gets stable, you know that you've probably got the answer. And you probably need about 1,500 animals in the stroke literature, in however many experiments that takes. Uh, if you look in the stroke literature uh, for the clot-busting drug TPA, so you have a stroke, you've got a blood clot in an artery in your head, you give the clot-busting drug, it, uh, it dissolves the clot, the blood gets back to the brain, you, you live with it. Time is critical in that treatment in humans, and we know that the effectiveness disappears with the delay in onset from the, from the stroke to, to the treatment being given. If you look at the decay constant, if you like, in the animal studies testing it, and in the human studies testing it, they're just about on top of each other when you've got 3,000 animals in the TPA literature to play with. So if you get big data from animals, uh, and certainly in some circumstances, it can be highly predictive of efficacy in human studies. TPA is really a plumbing problem rather than anything more biochemically complicated than that. So who knows? Uh, but but the, the injunction that I would give is that the reduction bit of the three Rs when first proposed, at least in the summary, and I know I get pushed back for this, was to stop the chemical industry testing these thousand drugs in these thousand animal experiments to see if they improved outcome in these thousand conditions. Uh, and that's clearly a waste of animals. But I think in some cases we've gone too far. I think institutions are complicit with it because it reduced the cost of research, it reduced the <coughs> timelines to getting results, and our experiments are now too small, and we should have bigger experiments and better done experiments. And we are working with others in Europe and with NIH here to develop uh, a, a system to a framework to allow multi-center animal studies for that critical pre-human clinical trial proof of concept. So I think there are some things that, that can be done to increase it. Size is one of the important things. Yes, sir. Uh, Bob Words, uh, National Eye Institute, uh, NIH. Um, I, I wonder, I, I'd like to get your reaction if uh, the structure of publication hasn't contributed to this problem. So for example, w when I started in science, you had an introduction which is going to tell you what's in the experiment. Then you had methods of how you're going to do it. Then you said what you found. And then you said what you thought it meant. Now you go straight from the introduction to the results. That's fine. It, it, uh, the, the critical parts of methods are, in fact, in, in the results. But uh, the methods are l treated as leftovers. So if there's space, uh, there's space at the end, very limited, you can describe the methods. And then you describe the rest of the methods in supplementary material. Uh, and I think this uh, lowers the uh, desirability of of having a complete method section. And on the confidential statement to, to the reviewer, I really disagree with that because the person who is going to want to know the methods is just a, a tiny fraction of the people who are going to read the paper. And they're the ones who are going to try and reproduce it. They ought to know everything 
that uh, is is available about the the method, and I, I I must say I I would never start an experiment in an area I'm not intimately familiar with without calling the authors and, and and chatting with them, and this is a description of the problem with the method sections. I, I will say to that that I think you're right, and not only that. It is a problem that pervades all research. It's not just in vivo work with animals. It is sometimes with very arcane, uh, highly biophysical experiments uh, as well, and everything in between. Um, the journals, uh, especially those journals uh, that Malcolm pointed out that are the high impact journals, tend uh, to leave out very important uh, things about how they did experiments. Uh, and it's not usually a bias on the part of the individuals who are writing the paper. Uh, it is that they think, and I think that's the key to why these uh, advanced institutions uh, that are so highly thought of are so much less likely to present uh, any cautionary or uh, really uh, not directly important data, they don't imagine that they might be wrong. Uh, and if they don't imagine they might be wrong, that's because the world is telling them that they are correct. I can still remember to this day, I was 32 years old, when I first realized that science was about finding answers to questions that you didn't already know. I had spent four and a half years in research thinking that it was to find answers to questions that were already known, but just to show them more solidly. And that's because what I observed in the people around me was exactly that behavior. I've continued to observe that behavior. Uh, but it's not true. What you want to do is to find something that isn't known. So I've been worried about the other side of this Jeremiah that I've been talking about, what it does to uh, actual uh, innovation and creativity in science, because I think it's actually squeezing that. And I think the end result of what the way I've been worrying about it and the way Malcolm has been worrying about it, that we may end up with results, all of which are boring, and many of which are not even true. <laughs> that would be the absolute worst thing that science could possibly do. Uh, so what we need to do is to somehow or another restore the notion that self-doubt is really a very worthwhile uh, a part of the psychological armamentarium of good scientists and that it is okay to be doubting your results. You should be doubting them every minute. And that is very hard to do except by example. And there are not a lot of examples thick on the ground at my institution in the high arcane reaches of uh, biochemistry and genetics. And my bet is there are not a whole lot of examples like that in animal work as well, although I don't know that as well as you guys do. So just on the protocol question, uh, so gold standard is that you publish the protocol before the work begins, and if you have to change the protocol, then you do so in a, in a, in a public way. People get very twitchy about this, and so the lowest rung on the ladder is that at least the reviewer can see it and then it's made public afterwards. What I'd like to see is something like clinicaltrials.gov where you put in preclinical trials, what you're going to do, you update it in real time, and if you wish, you can set a sunrise clause on it that says this is available to people that I give a blind URL to for the first three or four years, and then it's open up to everyone else to, to look at it. So, so I think that we need to find a way of convincing the community that they're not going to lose all their intellectual property by telling everybody <laughs> the experiments that they're going to be doing next year. But I, but I do think that there needs to be a, a public accountability in what people are going to do. And you should be able to see exactly and precisely what they're doing. And we make all our protocols for systematic reviews available before we start data collection, because that, that makes us 
more robust and, and you're, you're the most critical person of your own work should be yourself and unless you show that example to people then, then you'll just disappear into a morass. Our final comment from the floor and then we'll move on and I'll ask the panelists to be brief in their responses. Okay, so I uh, couldn't resist following up on the reduction thing, Malcolm. <laughs> Um, because, I, I mean, I agree that Russell and Birch did talk about the sort of fishing trip uh, kind of research, but they also did go on to talk about experimental design. And so, I mean, I guess for me it, it's really about, you know, making sure that experiments are properly powered. Um, and I think, you know, that's a responsibility of the funding agencies that review grants, as well as whoever is in charge of giving approval to the, the projects to continue, whether that's done centrally as it is in some countries, or whether it's done more at the local animal care committee or animal ethics committee level as it is in Canada. So Jonathan and I were at a, an animal care committee coordinators meeting in Montreal not long ago, and uh, Jonathan asked, you know, whether they looked at uh, samples science sizes and ask the questions and there was kind of a, a blank stare in the room. Uh, so certainly in Canada, I mean, that's one thing that we want to sort of follow up on to see what animal care committees are doing because there was that suggestion in the Salmon article that it's the, it's the animal care committees that are actually driving down the numbers of animals and leading to underpowered experiments because they're keen to essentially in, um, follow the principle of reduction and not fully understanding what the principle of reduction actually is. Uh, so, so, yes, I agree. Uh, two things, though. One is that if you observe science as currently practiced, there are more underpowered experiments than there are overpowered experiments, and that may be because the effect sizes we're looking for now are smaller than they were 60 years ago. Uh, so that's the first thing, and uh, there was a second thing which I've forgotten about, which I'll tell you over coffee. I oh, know the uh, still forgot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking our uh, panelists for our first session.